Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, or day, wherever you are. And welcome back to uh, the second in a video series about the relative usefulness um, and the context in which we might say uh, something like alignment or neutrality, like neutral pelvis, neutral spine. Those kinds of conversations which are ubiquitous in the movement and fitness world. There's something I talk about a lot um, you know, while teaching a class, so I think they can be really useful and also very limited. So part two of this, just a quick review, part one, we talked about how alignment, what we really mean when we say that is a body part in relation to another body part or sort of a body unto itself. Uh, so if you want to watch that, watch that. We're going to take that idea and uh, put that on hold. It'll come back. But the, the second thing in this that I want to introduce is sort of the limitations of any kind of alignment conversation. And that is essentially, if we're going to talk about biomechanics, it's tone. Alignment doesn't really talk very well. And if it does, it's only very subtly speaks to tone. So what do I mean by tone? I mean a, a muscle or a tissue is, is sort of flexed or, or turned on. So for the very simple experiment, which can be fun to do, you don't even have to imagine, right? Sit in whatever alignment you want to sit in and then flex everything. Flex your arms, your face, your throat, right? What just changed about, about your alignment? Probably something, you know, your head and neck probably took on a different position than before you did that tone. Your elbow might have flexed a couple degrees, but by and large, from the viewpoint of a sort of outside body alignment, you didn't change very much, and yet your felt experience, or sort of your experience of being in a body, or even if you were looking at someone doing that, your experience of that person is really different, right? So it, um, in the, I'll just say that again, in the alignment conversation, what happened was very subtle but there's something else that happened. There's another way of looking that's not subtle at all. It would be like um, watching a sunset and if it suddenly got way warmer out, you'd be like, whoa, this is a really different experience, even though the colors of the sunset might not have changed at all. So if you were just measuring color, um, that's a little different because those aren't necessarily correlated, like tone and position are correlated. Um, so yeah, another example, maybe just in, Standing or sitting again, maybe a more subtle one. You can envision like grip your pelvic floor Like do a do a kegel really grip your pelvic floor and then squeeze around your genitals and your anus and your Your pelvic floor and you can feel like wow that could be a really different way to move through the world versus uh, Release there and most of us are probably living somewhere in between those two extremes uh, where this comes into uh, movement practices, I think, can be changes, or what I want to propose, changes that are very uh, subtle in terms of alignment can have a radical impact, and it gets more and more refined the more you uh, open up your ability to, to feel and be aware of these changes, but this is not subtle stuff. So I think a great example is the hip hinge. Uh, which is used in lots of different arts and, and movement practices and, you know, I don't know about meditative traditions, but a lot of movement practices, which is essentially, I keep my spine in a relative neutral and I, I hinge over at the hips. So in a weightlifting class, they might talk about flatten your back. You know, in yoga, they might give a bunch of different cues and there's a guy, Foundation, which is a really cool program, or, um, who would talk about push back into your hamstrings. It's getting a little bit more actually into what we're gonna talk about, of that sensation. How do you know you're pushing into your hamstrings? It's a sensation, right? It's not a, it's not a position. Flatten your back is a position pointing to, I would propose the thing that really matters about a flat back is what is engaged and what isn't when you're flattening your back, getting ready to lift a weight you are pressing your legs back to sort of light up this whole, you know, posterior line in the back of you to lift. And it depends on the lift you're doing, and I'm certainly no expert, in fact, I'm quite a novice, but really enjoy weightlifting. Uh, so it'll really depend on what it is. So just like last time was not about yoga, this is not about how to lift weights or even how to hip hinge. But consider a hip hinge, I have a feeling here of a loaded hamstring, it's sort of this whole line I can feel. I can break that 
so to speak, with just watch, the, watch my pelvis. Right? There's a little tip and a kind of loss of energy. This isn't something I can show you on camera, right? But it does have a certain aesthetic. If you're a movement teacher or you've been doing this for a while, you might even be able to notice aesthetically the difference between this. Here I am, kind of hip hinged, I'm not sure what to do with my arms. <laughs> but I can feel my continuous energy here. And then I just do a little break in alignment. And it's still there to a certain extent, but we'll say for all intents and purposes, I've kind of lost that continuity. So is my back pretty much flat here? Yeah. This very small range of motion change, does that produce a really different effect in my body? Yeah, for sure. And again, your body and what you're doing might, um, might really develop as your, as your awareness of your body um, opens up. I just want to show this. It's really the same example. Ugh, maybe this won't tip, but uh, downward dog. So if you could say getting your foot in the door, this is pretty much the exact same movement actually, but getting your foot in the door, someone might say, okay, you know, flatten your back out. I'm gonna check my shirt in so you can see. Actually, that's not a very common cue. You could say, okay, you wanna have a you know, more or less straight spine as opposed to being here, right? This clearly, I'm, I'm not doing it. So I press up and back, so here's me doing that thing where I'm really lifting my pelvis up and back, which is irrespective of position in some ways. But if I just think, okay, get my heels down to the floor, you might notice how really my hamstring length didn't change. I just gave a little bit from here down to there, which hints at our relative alignment conversation and how it's gonna fit into this. Um, but it's a really different feeling. I feel this in a really different way, and for me, much less in integrity way, versus if I bend my knees, press up and back. Give me... I feel like I've said this a hundred times, but <laughs> I'll just say it again. And that, you know, the Ebony alignment isn't that different, but the felt sense of it, and even there's a certain aesthetic quality of it that is radically different. So this video is sort of on what alignment um, not, not doesn't speak to, but only speaks to, it's not the right tool. Using alignment to talk about tone is like using a hammer to get a screw in, right? You can, you can do it, you can kind of get it in there, and it's, but it's a clumsy tool. It's not the right tool. Um, that's part two. Hope this helps. I don't know if I said my name. I'm Liam Bowler. This is Dynamic Alignment Bodywork. <laughs> I have a podcast called The Body Awake. If you'd like to check any of those things out, Please do. The podcast, really, we don't talk about stuff like this, but I write about it.